Um, so thank you very much everyone for coming along to what promises to be a really stimulating session this evening. Um, this is one of the Parks Institute research seminars and uh, Dr Holly Morse has joined us um, to share her particular um, work. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction um, to Holly, um, but just on some practical um, matters first. Um, do remember that the session is being recorded. Um, so if you don't want to be recorded, please just keep your camera off. Um, so that we can uh, make sure we're following your wishes there. And the uh, plan for this session is actually to finish by 7pm um, today. Um, so Holly will give her uh, talk for about 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have the remaining um, time for any questions that you might have. Um, so please do start putting those in the chat um, during the um, talk, or you can raise your hand um, afterwards um, to have your questions. Um, but now I'll introduce um, Holly. So thank you very much um, for joining us, Holly. Um, so Dr. Holly Morse is lecturer in Bible, Gender and Culture at the University of Manchester. Um, her ongoing research interests include the Hebrew Bible, biblical reception, magical and spiritual activism, heresy and gender. Um, her last book is related to today's topic and is on Encountering Eve's Afterlives, a new reception critical approach to Genesis 2 to 4, which was published by OUP in 2020. And Holly is co-founder of the Bible, Gender and Church Research Centre. And she's also setting up an AHRC funded research network around the topic of using God, reading the Bible in the Me Too age. Um, she's currently researching cultural feminizations of transgressive knowledge and magic in the West from antiquity to today. Um, so thank you again, um, Holly, for joining us. And we're really looking to hearing about your work. And the title is Falling for the Devil, Eve and the Witch in Modern Feminist Activism and Anti-Witchcraft Ideology. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Helen, for that um, really kind introduction. And it's uh, it's great to be here and um, lovely to see so many people. Um, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint before I kick off. Um, so I'm going to do that and then I'm going to. So is that working? Is that just the um, PowerPoint's just visible there? Great. Yeah, that's working. Okay, I'm going to begin. Great. Um, so as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about Genesis 2 to 4, I'm pleased to be coming to this research seminar today with some new beginnings. This paper represents a new phase of research for me that I've recently embarked on, which is inspired by um, the contemporary political landscape and in particular feminist protest culture. And um, second, the habit Western culture has had for telling tales about two transgressive females, Eve and the witch. And actually my interest in those two figures together, it really comes out of that first focus on uh, feminist activism. In many ways, I'm gonna be telling you my own tale, which is a story of how this particular research product has grown from contemplating the power of the phrase Eve was framed in the 1970s um, material, feminist material culture of protest to beginning to explore the long history that Eve and the witch have had as subversive symbolic sisters. And I guess um, the operative word being beginning there, I'm just going to be able to sort of dip a toe into some of the things that I've been thinking about recently. In particular, my focus will be on the close associations between Eve and the satanic witch. This is the kind of witch, a person who practices magic, who in Western culture becomes the witch with a capital W a female who practices magic to do harm and who has allied herself with the devil in order to gain power and pleasure. A figure who was conceived of in text of anti-witchcraft inquisitors, judges and demonologists, largely from the 15th century onwards through to the meeting, um, through the meeting of a Christian commitment to erasing heresy and an anxiety around the continued presence of traditional folk practices across Europe. But actually, from the work that I'm doing um, that isn't fully represented in this paper, but it's part of the, the larger project that it's um, growing out of and growing into, I'd argue there are even deeper roots um, that go back to kind of biblical um, early Jewish and early Christian ideas about magic and women. So this is a paper about two female figures created by male authors, each of whom, according to the popular retellings of their stories in Western patriarchal culture, end up falling for the devil. 
and two female figures who have also been appropriated and allied in powerful and creative ways by feminist activists and agents throughout the history of women's the women's movement from the 19th century onwards. In speaking about the relationship between Eve and the witch, I'm interested in particular um, in a type of storytelling, myth-making. The kind of myth-making that sees the stories of female characters in Western culture, in this case, Eve and the witch, told so many times over and over throughout the ages as a means of defining the nature of woman, that what was once fabricated and fictional becomes naturalized and real. Eve and the witch become metonymic women, and all women become Eves and witches. I'm also interested in feminist revisionist myth-making, which seeks to identify and retell these stories to break the illusion that they are normal and natural, and to animate old tales with new energy. So for this reason, in this paper, I'm less interested in what the biblical text actually says about Eve or what women doing magic really were getting up to. And I'm more interested in the process of symbolification in which both Eve and the witch have been entangled. In other words, I'm interested in the discourses of Eve and the witch and the overlaps or resonances between the two and what that can tell us about the conceptualizations of women knowing and acting in the same way that Kimberly Stratton, in her Naming the Witch, investigates the discourse of magic, which she describes as something, and this is to quote her, that includes stereotypes, accusations, and counter-legislation. In much the same way that Stratton argues that magic is constructed through shared belief, and this shared belief um, within a particular culture then acquires power, forever, she says, altering the way certain practices are people, people are viewed, Today, I'm going to begin the task of arguing for the same cultural construction and indeed mutual co-construction of the figures of Eve and the Witch. So why storytelling today rather than paper presenting? Well, my framing of my paper is just another story in the history of telling tales about these two women comes in response to Diane Perkis' provocative question, what if academic histories, irrespective for the moment of their truth and falsity, could be considered as myths? I would tend to agree with the position implied by Perkis's statement that uh, that is precise that this is actually myth making precisely what academic histories do do. And so in telling my tale of Eve and the Witch, I'm hoping to add another story into the mix about these two feminine symbols, or to be aware that my approach to the scholarship as a kind of feminist academic revisionist myth maker is precisely the kind of approach to scholarship that Diane Perkis has observed being categorized as one of the slipshod historical methods of the believing women, which has consistently been contrasted with the skeptical objectivity necessary for true history. Indeed, her work describes how several uh, feminist scholars of witchcraft have become the whipping girls of the historical method, presented as biased, predictable, and in many ways, all too close for, to their own subjects than is comfortable. But I've decided I'm fine with that. So this paper is less about history as fact-finding and more about it is as fiction fathoming. We'll begin at the beginning of my research process, which started out as an investigation of the shared space that even the witch occupy in the symbolic economy of feminist iconography uh, from the late 1960s, but mostly the 1970s to today. And if we've got time, we might even have a brief foray into the 19th century too. In order to explore the resonances we find between these two fi figures and their feminist function. Ultimately, I want to argue that the pair are symbolic subversive sisters representing women's appropriation of images that have been made to signify the repression of women, but also the co-location of wickedness and women's knowledge. This will lead us today, as it, have as it has led me through my research, to spend some time considering how this tense view of women as both weak and strong in relation to patriarchal culture also perm permeates the most prolific phase of um, associated, associated even the witch, the birth of the satanic witch, uh, and in particular, the Malleus Maleficarum. One of the most intriguing features for me in the study of the history of Eve's reception has been her importance for the material culture of the women's movement that emerged with second wave feminism, and in particular, women's protest of the 1970s. In a movement which set the scene, or perhaps continued the trend, for a strong correlation between atheism and feminism, it struck me as interesting that Eve continued to be a poster girl of the grassroots and activist elements of this movement for religious feminists and uh, non. 
During a period of research at the Women's Library, which is an amazing collection at LSE that tells the story of the campaign for women's rights and women's equality from the beginnings of the suffrage movement to the present day, I was seeking uh, to explore the extent to which imagery and slogans relating to religious ideas were represented amongst the posters, badges and other paraphernalia. And here I discovered, alongside other classical materials such as the Women's Liberation Movement stickers with the famous logo of the symbol for Venus encompassing a phrased clenched fist, and Reclaim the Night banners, in the collection of protest badges, two images of apples on them, accompanied by the text, Eve was framed. These badges, like all other badges and many elements of grassroots activist material culture, function as a political shorthand, identifying the wearer with their cause, injecting the statements of protest or calls for change into the public space around the wearer. And Eve was one of the cultural myths that needed sorting. These badges are, of course, not the only appearance this famous statement makes in feminist material culture. It also appears on protest posters, bumper stickers and t-shirts. Indeed, so definitive was it as a slogan for the women's movement that it appeared on the cover of the first series of, um, an, of a range of issues of Life magazine that ran on the woman problem then and now, printed uh, first on the 13th of August 1971. Inside the covers, one of the articles which focuses on the issue of women's historical oppression opened with the line, ever since Eve, the real problem has been the fears and wishes of men clearly identifying Eve as a tale men have been telling about their anxieties and desires concerning women. Eve is then described as the first uppity woman who has been represented as the mother to many more defective daughters of Eve. But the phrase uppity woman here not only suggests the sense in which Eve has been mislabeled with negative effect, but also hints at the possibility that beneath the tar of the patriarchal brush is a woman quite close to the feminist um, telling the world she was framed. So an identification we can see between uh, Eve as uppity woman and the feminists who also saw themselves as being labeled as uppity women. A woman who pushed back, who broke with the order she was given. Already then it's becoming clear that far from being simply a matter for religious feminists of the women's movement, the figure of Eve was one who needed to be liberated in order for all other women to be liberated too. The idea that Eve was framed appears to have summarized the way that women of the time who appropriated this slogan felt, hemmed in by the inequalities they found themselves surrounded by in Western culture and ready to get uppity to bring about a change. Indeed, I was struck recently to see how deeply embedded this slogan has become in the memory of the material culture and symbolism of the women's liberation movement in the 1970s, when it made an appearance on the historico-political drama, Mrs. America, which was released in 2020. The premise of the series was to dramatize the political unrest that emerged between different women-run political groups around the Equal Rights Amendment, designed to guarantee equal legal rights for all American citizens, regardless of sex. In one scene of the episode entitled Shirley, which takes inspiration from Shirley Chisholm's battle as an African-American woman to retain her place in the race for the presidential nomination in the 1972 Democratic National Convention, we hear the phrase being used. As Bella Abzug, Congresswoman and co-founder of the National Organization for Women and the National Women's Political Caucus, welcomes George McGovern, a competitor to Shirley's candidacy to the stage, McGovern arrives thanking Bella for her gracious introduction, jokingly responding by saying, thank you, Bella, but I can't take all the gratitude. Some of it has to go to Adam. At which point women in the audience begin to shout, Eve, Eve, Eve was framed. This statement as a response to the situations in which women perceive themselves to be pushed into problematic corners or misrepresented appeared to have made its way beyond the material culture of the 1970s and, like its subject, to have become something of an icon. Eve, then, is the first framed woman, and thus a figure with whom many women within patriarchal systems of oppression can relate to, a fitting symbol for their fight. But there are also other aspects of Eve the icon that contributed to her representation as the first feminist. Her curiosity and her de desire for transgressive transformative knowledge. Alongside Eve, alongside Eve being framed and her closely associated symbols, the bitten apple and the rib, sorry, alongside Eve being framed, her closely associated symbols, the bitten apple and the rib also became famous symbolic shorthand for feminist culture creation. 
Perhaps the most iconic example of an allusion to Eve in the women's liberation movement is the feminist magazine, at least in British context, the feminist magazine uh, Spare Rib, launched in 1972. Spare Rib was the most significant magazine of the women's liberation movement in Britain of 1970s and 1980s, according to British Library curator Louise Kimpton Nye in her introduction to the uh, BL's digital project about the publication. Founded by Marsha Rowe and Rosie Boycott, the aim of the uh, Spare Rib was to provide a space in the media for women to discuss, write and read about crucial issues they felt to be missing in mainstream media. In an email exchange I had uh, with Marsha Rowe, she told me that initially the idea of calling the magazine Spare Rib was a joke, made over a meal shared by Rowe, Boycott and friends. While discussing potential titles, one of the guests jokingly suggested that the the name Spare Rib. Recalling that day, Roe explains that late that night, mulling over the evening, I had a light bulb moment and realized this would be a brilliant name for our new magazine. While the biblical echoes were clear to Roe, so was the opportunity to subvert them. Using the title Spare Rib allowed the possibility, and this is a quote from Roe, to turn that, and by that she means the idea of female inferiority and disposableness, around to foreground the woman as well as alluding to, to an important sense of new birth, creating something new, all of which have kind of echoes with the figure of Eve, who's you know, a, a pivotal um, figure in her narrative, and also, of course, the first mother. The editorial in the first issue appears to play knowingly on the importance of the association between Eve, knowledge, and generativity, thanks to their choice of title, Spare Rib is a Beginning. With this, Marsha Rowe suggested that we intended no less than to take on the culture of the whole Western world, finding a new language for both image and word to establish women's changing identity. Indeed, the magazine carved out a crucial space for women to recreate and recreate what being a woman meant, and thus to rewrite the old misogynistic image of Eve, metonymic woman, the spare rib, into something rebellious, knowing, and powerful. By appropriating Spare Rib, the magazine also appropriated Eve. And because of its important position in the cultural history of the women's liberation movement, it offers a potent example of the ways in which women continue to reshape the negative image of Eve by actively participating in reframing her. Another icon of feminist culture creation and knowledge production uh, is the feminist press Virago. Launched in 1973, the publishing house initially in many ways grew out of the success of Spare Rib magazine and was, its, uh, was in its earliest incarnation known as Spare Rib Books, but there was a change of name. It was founded by Rosie Boycott and Marsha Rowe, who were then joined by Carmen Khalil, a successful publicist. The aim of Virago was to be, and this is a quote from um, their marketing, the first mass market publisher for 52% of the population, women. An exciting new imprint for both sexes in a changing world. The publishing house also set itself a mission to champion women's voices and bring them to the widest possible readership around the world. From fiction and politics to history and classic children's stories, our writers, Virago claim, continue to win acclaim, break new ground and enrich the lives of readers. And long before the famous technology company on whom many of us, including me right now, are so reliant, took the image of the bitten apple as its logo. Virago chose to place an image of Eve's half devoured fruit on each of its books, in doing so framing the Garden of Eden as a story of transgressive and subversive female knowledge and representing the invisible Eve as an agent of power. In an email conversation I had with Lenny Goodings, now chair at Virago, she told me that Virago, this is a quote, was a cheeky provocative name for the company. And so an apple with a cheeky bite, I love that she uses cheeky twice in this, uh, not least referencing Eve was a great logo for a new company. By choosing the fruit of knowledge as their logo and placing this on the front of their books, the publishing house humorously and effectively made each of their readers an Eve, reading and gaining knowledge of women's writing and hearing women's voices that have been denied a platform for centuries. And actually at this point, like, it would be really interesting to think about the resonances that there are with Lilith magazine that came out in America in the late 1970s as well. And as yet, my research hasn't kind of gone there and, and expanded that um, 
this kind of symbolic economy that I'm starting to sort of build up in terms of um, religious iconography in uh, feminist material culture and protest culture. But certainly I think um, there's some more uh, work to be done there. Okay, so far, so interesting. For the feminist protest movement, Eve was a political, a powerful political symbol, both for her oppression, but also for her action. And so as I reflected on Eve's place in the material and symbolic culture of the feminist movement, and I continued to turn around questions of why she, more than many other women, I wouldn't say any other, but many other women, was so important for the feminist retelling of history and creating culture, it became apparent that there was another important um, character in this story of framed women being liberated. The Eve was not the lone symbol of feminist activism, but that she functioned alongside another much maligned, but nonetheless, nonetheless subversive sister. While Eve was being invoked in the feminist culture of the 1960s and 70s, from magazines and publishing to protest posters and badges, Another important symbolic presence was growing within the women's movement, and that was the witch. Both the stereotypical pointy-hatted hexing hag and the neo-pagan wicker witch of, new, of the new spirituality movement. Indeed, sometimes these two witches merged into one, depending on the particular feminist you spoke to. In the main, today, but not in general, uh, I'm interested in the way the former begins to crop up in feminist protest, so the kind of um, stereotyped symbol uh, of a witch, rather than um, really getting into the um, uh, Wicca and um, neo-pagan um, feminist practice. Um, here I'll talk about one um, main example of how witches began manifesting in feminist actions in the West, and then link that to some of the kind of more um, uh, sort of scholarly academic feminist work that picked up this image too. Um, and so I want to narrate some of the ways in which their appropriative appearances, the symbol of the witch and the figure of Eve, bear resemblance to one another. In particular, I want to suggest that in telling, in the feminist tale telling of the 20th century, the witch, like Eve, functions as a figure of both identifiable oppression, but also a model of inspirational transgressive knowledge. The first example of the appearance of the witch in second wave feminist activism comes from witch. Women's international terrorist conspiracy from hell, maybe the best activist name that's ever happened. Also known as women incensed at telephone company harassment. Also known as women inspired to tell their collective history. Also known as women inspired, interested in toppling consumer holidays. Which then, as you have already gathered, uh, is a searingly comedic yet deeply serious collective that emerged from a larger group of radical cultural social feminist, socialist feminists in the 1960s. The group which were left wing and interested in a range of social issues, including female liberation, <clears throat> uh, ending capitalism and protecting free speech amongst other things. As you can see in the images on the slide, they presented themselves dressed in stereotypically witchy garments. They usually appeared in all black robes, often accompanied by pentagrams and pointy hats. In doing so, they deliberately appropriated the problematic representations of witches as othered women, homogenized into a single threatening image. Dressed in their spooky garments, which undertook a range of protest acts, including collectively hexing Wall Street in 1968, as a response to unfair capitalist trading practices. They also protested a bridal convention holding banners and signs describing marriage as slavery and arrived to hex Nix's inauguration uh, in Washington in 1969. And I don't think we'll have time to go in, into it today, but that arrival um, of them uh, at that inauguration and the hexing of a political leader has really major resonances with a big trend that pick back up again in 2016, 2017, um, around Trump's presidency, where um, an attempt to hex Trump, or to bind Trump actually more accurately, to bind Trump, i.e. to um, remove his power, um, went viral uh, amongst um, Instagram followers who followed the hashtag witches of Instagram, hashtag magic resistance. So there's this sense in which this idea of kind of tr transgressive knowledge, magic, um, 
and the power to do things outside of patriarchal order is something like fairly consistent uh, or at least has a consistent presence um, between um, the 1960s and 70s and now. For me, the attire chosen by which, when teamed with their redeployment of magic as a political tool, leaves us with a powerful but unspoken message, the witch was framed. The witch activists actively engaged a bad girl of history, blacklisted by patriarchal culture, and took her on as one of their own. To the extent that magic becomes converted from a force for evil to a force for political agency and change. In much the same way that Eve's apple on the cover of Virago, or mention of her role as the beginning of a rebellious gynocentric culture um, founded in a magazine, converts the condemned knowledge she acquires, oh, I skipped forward there, uh, she acquires in the garden by going against the ultimate patriarch's command into rebellious acquisition of wisdom of a new woman's world. Here, the negative image of the witch is similarly subverted which retain the imagery that reminds us the witch is a, a woman maligned by patriarchy, but this alienation and misrepresentation becomes a tool for defiant action. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the witch manifesto, where we get the clearest sense of how the figures of the witch functioned as a cipher through which radical cultural socialist feminist politics could flow. Witch is an all woman everything. It's an awareness that witches and gypsies were the original guerrillas and resistance fighters against oppression, particularly the oppression of women down through the ages. Witches have always been women who uh, dared to be groovy, courageous, aggressive, intelligent, non-conformist, explorative, curious, independent, sexually liberated, revolutionary. This possibly explains why nine million of them have been burned. And they're obviously they're taking um, a number that is no longer kind of accepted as um, accurate to the number of uh, women that died during the witch trials, but it's a politicized kind of use of historical knowledge. It's fiction, but a, a powerful one that has significant roots. I, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over my second example, which are the witches of Green, who are the witches of Green and Common, um, where the witch kind of played a really powerful symbol uh, in that protest movement. And there's some amazing material about that um, at Bradford University Archive. Uh, they've got the Sarah Mayer collection there. Um, and it's really incredible to see the level of kind of spiritual activism that was part of that protest camp and in particular how the witch as a figure, but also even the snake kind of crop up and reappear as these sort of like shorthand ways of talking about transgressive act, action as well as knowledge um, and um, also oppression. But we'll keep going. The feminist moral of the witchcraft story that we find in the performance of the figure of the witch by a witch resonates strongly with the messages concerning witchcraft produced in the highly political self-published pamphlets, uh, pa pamphlet, Witches, Midwives and Nurses, A History of Women Healers, written by Barbara Ehrenrich and Deirdre English during the 1970s. In this book, they claim that through the early modern period in particular, with the beginning of the witch craze in um, uh, the 15th century, women healers had been branded witches because of an anxiety about women's knowledge and agency concerning maternity and sexual health. This fitted into a wider analysis of the broader medicalization of the body and subsequently a male dominated professionalization of medicine. Working from observations Erin Rigg and English made about particular fear that anti-witchcraft writers of early modern period appeared to express about midwives, as embodied in the Manalius Maleficarum that we'll come to in a bit, they claim that the church saw its attack on peasant healers as an attack on magic, not medicine, thus highlighting the creativeness of the category um, division between the two things that theorists of magic, medicine, and indeed religion have been preoccupied for centuries. The devil was believed to have real power on earth and uh, the use of power by peasant women, whether for good or for evil, was frightening to the church and the state. In particular, Ehrenrich and English frame the anxiety they see in the church over women's medicinal practices as a powerful sign of the existence of culturally constructed, highly gendered differentiations of types of knowledge and ways of knowing. Ehrenrich and English present wise women and healers those women they believe the church labeled as witches, as early promoters of empirical experience-based knowledge. 
who were working in an era when the church discredited the value of the material world, they argue, and had a profound distrust of the senses. In their presentation of witchcraft, Enric and English's witches are not only close to Eve in that they are seen to be allied with the devil, but they are also women who have sought prohibited and feared knowledge and were condemned for it. Indeed, Enric and English point to the ways in which witches use their not this knowledge to overcome God's punishment of women in the garden, stating that midwives used ergot for the punish, uh, for the used ergot for the pain of labor at a time when the church held that pain and labor was the Lord's just punishment for Eve's sin. While the narrative of Ehrenrich and English has been critiqued for being low on evidence and too neat in its homogenization of witchcraft, critiques that I myself recognize, their story, as Perkis points out, is shaped by specific political realities of their time in much the same way that all the stories of women that we've encountered so far are. What is intriguing to me is, less the point of Ehrenrich and English make about uh, medical history and more the insights they have about knowledge, power and gender and the narrativization and the mythologization of those in relation to gender that resonates in both uh, Tales of the Witch and Tales of Eve. Okay, I think we might move forward a little bit. I was going to talk a little bit about a 19th century example that kind of also uh, makes a really close link between Eve and the witch that we find in Matilda Jocelyn Gage's work. Um, but uh, I think we won't have time for that. So if anybody would like to hear about that, do email me and I'm very happy to talk about it. What I want to do now before moving on to looking at the roots of this kind of connection that we're starting to see emerge is to just look at a couple of more examples that we find in absolutely contemporary um, protest culture and also popular culture that really um, drive home this connection. As well as looking to the, uh, to the past to secure the image of, the sister Eve, of Sister Eve and Sister Witch, we can also look to the present. Serendipitously, my continual fascination with the appropriation of both figures within feminist activism paid off when new and highly visible forms of occulture politics reappeared with a vengeance on the protest scenes from around 2010. Both Eve and the witch remain key players then in the current wave of feminism and its stance against patriarchal power. Indeed, iconography in Eve and the witch, of Eve and the witch has had a powerful impact not only on feminist activism, but also on LGBTQ plus rights movements and religious liberties activism as well as agents of change that continue to have resonances in all of which um, provide us with um, uh, continued evidence of the way that these agents of change um, are related to gender, power, knowledge, and the capacity to um, uh, alter the world. So the phrase Eve was framed uh, continues to appear at women's marches globally. And I've added a couple of examples from uh, recent, recent women's marches. And Eve pins, bumper stickers, and um, other material culture remain popular. The hashtag Eve was framed has a fairly strong presence on social media uh, platforms like Instagram, identifying posts relating to feminist causes, all once more attesting to Eve's longevity as feminism's every woman. Additionally, in recent years, the politicized Eve has emerged, has re-emerged on the stage of public activism in the context of occulture, gender, and sexuality with the work of a highly visible new religious movement that began in the United States, the Satanic Temple. Founded in 2012, the Satanic Temple celebrates the figure of Satan as a representation of liberty, pride, enlightenment, and rebellion. The Satanic Temple describes itself as a religious organization whose aim is to encourage benevolence, empathy amongst all people, reject tyrann tyrannical authority, advocate practical common sense, oppose injustice, and undertake noble pursuits. In a documentary film that follows the new religious movement entitled Hail Satan, a now controversially excommunicated leader within the Satanic Temple, Jex Blackmore, discusses her attraction to the movement and reflects on the Garden of Eden story. Jack Blackmore talks about how they played the figure of Eve in a school play and goes on to give their own interpretation of Genesis 2 to 3. Blackmore explains, Eve was very curious as her nature was a woman. The devil appeared in the form of a snake and offers the fruit of enlightenment. We are taught to fear that 
to fear that but at the same time it seems the most liberating because if we do not have the that opportunity we would have to be in total servitude without free choice and ultimate servitude is slavery for this modern movement which celebrates the transgressiveness of the figure of satan as a symbol of liberty eve is the first feminist who opens herself to enlightenment a large part of the work of the satanic temple uh, is around their commitment to religious liberty and equal representation in the United States. In particular, uh, um, they're engaged in pro protesting the display of solely Christian symbols on state property. They argue that either there should be no religious representation in state buildings or fair representation of all religions within the United States. So another example, so one example of this mode of protest took place at the Michigan Capitol uh, building in 2014 when Jex Blackmore erected an artwork, an artwork entitled Snake Activity, in which next to the image of a snake cowled around a black cross with a pentagram on it was the text, knowledge is the greatest gift. Blackmore commented, we really didn't feel comfortable with just a nativity scene being the only representation for the holidays on the Capitol grounds. While the image also seems to comment on capitalist messages that have become closely entwined with the celebration of Christmas. Um, and they did a similar thing um, in um, the Illinois Capitol Rotunda in 2016, where the um, uh, artwork that's on the slide with the, the hand holding the apple with the snake wrapped around it and the knowledge is the greatest gift underneath it was their addition to um, a nativity scene um, and also um, a menorah for Hanukkah. In each of these images, Eve becomes the ideal religious adherent of Satan, but by extension, because of the group's political stance and icon for women's emancipation, LGBTQIA plus rights and religious tolerance. I'm still conscious of time, so I'm going to skip forward through the, the popular culture example of um, Sabrina the Teenage Witch on Netflix, because I think, again, um, that's something that I can talk to you about later. The next thing that I want to look at. So I'll take you to the next stage of the research. So having noticed all of this kind of plethora of Eve witch imagery that is really highly supported also um, in um, things like the, the chilling adventures of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, showing that there's a like, real cultural moment for associating these figures with one another that I think is reliant on a fairly consistent um, connection between the two. The next stage of my research really developed from two questions that began to nag at me as I learned more and more of how deep rooted in grassroots and popular culture the symbolic similarities of even the witch are. To the point that we could think of them as symbolic sisters of the women's movement, and we could reconceive Eve in this particular worldview as the first feminist and the first witch. But how long had these two been sisters and what was it that made them so powerfully close? And what does their partnership in the present, their place in feminist culture, tell us about her con their, the conceptualization of the past? Themes of femininity, transgression, subversion, devilry, and forbidden fruit were all swirling around my mind. The logical place to begin to tentatively explore possible answers to some of these questions is to investigate the emergence of the satanic witch in the 15th and 16th centuries a period that some have argued represented an era during which time um, during which during which time witch hunting only served the purpose of woman hunting written by heinrich kramer latinized to he uh, henry Cass institor with jacob springer cited as co-author it was published in 1486 originating from southern germany written in latin and thanks to the recently print, invented printing press, circulated in higher numbers than many other previously produced anti-witchcraft texts. The Malleus Maleficarum was, according to Christopher Mackay and many other scholars, the first major treatment of Satanism to appear in print and remains far and away the best known handbook on the subject from the early modern period. So if I wanted to get a handle on you know, the way that the, the even which symbolism was uh, being used today and being remembered from the past, it seemed like a good place to start. Furthermore, as Tamar Herzig has observed, it's the characterization of the diabolic female witch, which influenced the notions expressed in the writings of later demonologists and witch hunters that created a uniformity of discourse in the witchcraft debate of the 16th and 17th centuries. The way this text specifically shaped the feminist imaginary concerning the burning times 
is attested fairly consistently throughout the literature I've surveyed and is exemplified in works like Erin Rick in English, but also um, activists like Starhawk who spend a long time thinking about uh, how they identify themselves as witches and how that relates to uh, an imagined uh, part, um, an imagined and historical past um, of um, uh, persecution. Although this is a pre-Reformation Catholic text, it remained highly influential because it so clearly established satanic feminine witchcraft and diabolism as central features in the European discourse around magic, a theme in thinking that had only really begun to emerge with force in the mid-15th century, a theme that surprised some of the time who had previously associated magic with necromancy and its male practitioners. The Malleus Maleficarum itself is a complex text written in the style of a questio disputata or dis a disputation akin to theological texts of the scholastic period and is likely most indebted to Aquinas in the form it takes. The text has two aims, first to prove demons and sorcery are real and second to demonstrate that participation in heresy of sorcery is particularly characteristic of women. The Malleus, Malleus Maleficarum then was not interested in all magics, but primarily in Magicus Maleficium, which has alternately been translated as witchcraft or sorcery. Precisely how to conceptualize Maleficium is complex, but involves broadly partnership with the devil, conducting magic to do harm, and of course denying God. As Brodel puts it, Maleficium is not simply a kind of magic or occult harm, but harm wrought through a cooperative, a cooperative endeavor on the part of the witch and the devil when bound together in a contractual relationship. So this seems like a good place to try to find out more about even the witch's relationship. Um, Part one, Malleus Maleficarum is structured in three parts. Part one is it has the aim of proving the reality of sorcery. Part two covers the procedures of sorceresses and the way to counteract them. And part three provides tools for how to prosecute witches by ecclesiastical and secular judges. Key features of the satanic witch that emerge from this um, material. One, that she enters a pact with the devil. Two, she has sexual relations with devils or demons. Three, she participates in aerial flight. Four, participation in satanic gathering. Five, um, maleficent magic. And six, the slaughter of babies. It's part one of the Malleus Maleficarum that we're interested today to bring this paper to a close that indicates to us the ways in which uh, the writers constructed their image of the rebellious and carnal witch from the existing gender beliefs not least because the heart from existing gender beliefs not least because at the heart of this discussion of why women are more attracted to the heresy of sorcery to the extent that the malleus maleficarum rename it as the heresy of sorceresses we find the figure of eve part one question six despite it despite its initial title there follows a discussion of sorceresses subordinating themselves to demons which does not suggest the ensuing direction it takes in the first paragraph claims the first question will be a general one concerning the general circumstances of the condition of women. The second will be a specific one concerning which specific sort of women are found to be superstitious and sorceresses. And the third will be a particular one concerning midwives who surpass all others in evil. Two points of interest to note here. First, at the beginning of this section of the treatise, the writers do not appear to suggest that all women are equally attracted to witchcraft, but that some women are more likely to fall for the devil than others. Secondly, at the outset, unlike in all, all other previous or subsequent questions around themes to do with sorcery in the Malleus Maleficarum, the writers do not attempt to offer any arguments that might contradict the claim that women are more likely to be attracted to sorcery or witchcraft than men, because and this is a direct quotation, experience itself makes such things believable. In the words of Brodel, the writers are adamant that their characterization of witches as predominantly female is no more than an accurate description of reality. One of the various arguments for why women by nature are more attracted to superstition is developed through a metonymic reading of Eve. Although the sections feature section features reference um, a range of different historical women and writings about women, it struck me that along with Ben Sira's misogyny, Genesis 2 to 3 made reference, is made reference to repeatedly and often quite extensively. In the context of a discussion of good women, 
in whom God has performed good deeds, for example, Deborah, Jael, Judith, Esther, and bad women who are likely to be witches, the writers of the Malleus Maleficarum bring up the argument that in scripture, they say bad things about women for the most part in the Old Testament because of the sinner, Eva and her imitators. Although um, the, the writers also recognize with a powerful and unexamined supersessionism that all this changed with the New Testament because the name changed Eva becoming Ave. In many ways, the paralleling of Eve with Mary through the pun Eva and the angel's greeting to Mary Ave in the Latin of Luke 128 draws attention to a specific aspect of the dichotomization of the two women. This facet of their typology serves to emphasize the faithlessness of Eve, and thus according to the writers of the Malleus Maleficarum, all of, her uh, all of her imitators who follow her, who listened to the snake and the faithfulness of Mary, who in obedience observed the words of God through his angelic messenger. This is built on a revered tradition of male Christian theologians pairing these two women. Um, and actually, it's really interesting to explore the way that Eve is represented as a, an example, a primary example of bad faith heresy because of the way that she interacts with the snake. The text goes on to suggest that women are more attracted to sorcery and its promise of a sexual relationship with the devil because she is, direct quote, more carnal than a man, as is clear in connection with many carnal acts. These defects can also be noticed in the shaping of women since she was formed from a curved rib, that is from the rib of the chest that is twisted and contrary, so to speak. To man, she is an imperfect animal. She is always deceiving. Genesis 2, 21 to 22 is here used in a way that was not uncommon amongst medieval and early modern interpreters to argue that the bodily material from which woman was created meant she would be more carnal by nature. More specifically, the use of the rib or side of man meant she is curved in appearance and protrudes outwards from the body, uh, which allowed for the assumption that where men was, man was straight and true, woman was deceptive and misleading. Uh, the idea of woman as defective is, of course, inherited from a rich tradition of medieval rewritings of Genesis 2 to 3, of which Thomas Aquinas is an ex excellent example and to whom the writers of the Malleus Maleficarum owe a great debt. He's regularly referenced throughout um, the text. And actually Aquinas seems to have wrestled with this um, idea too. Both he, he wrestles both with the idea that Eve is a, potentially a crooked rib, but he also goes on to spend time thinking about how um, a woman is, uh, because of her flawed nature, also has a propensity for bad belief. Um, in the first section of Aquinas' uh, summer, Aquinas raises an objection um, yeah, Aquinas raises an objection relating to Genesis 3, where he says there seems to have been a certain mo movement of unbelief in Eve, since she doubted what the Lord had said, as appears from her saying, lest perhaps we die. Aquinas later concludes that Eve did indeed, in listening to the snake, demonstrate considerable pride, which ultimately led the woman to doubt God. For Aquinas, this sin of pride in the woman was greater than man's pridefulness. The shared sentiments that we find between Aquinas and his inheritor, the Malleus Maleficarum, both about uh, women's defectiveness, but also about their representation of bad faith, point to a theological milieu in which Eve was by nature inferior to man and yet more prideful. To the extent that she could be drawn into a full-blown heretical, it, she could be drawn into full-blown heretical behavior, desiring to obtain something against God's will. In this way, she formed the model for all other women who would become attracted to witchcraft. Women who, as Eve's imitators and the inheritors of her defect, would be open to engaging once more with the devil to secure the powers provided by his sorcery. But this view of women as proud, prideful and doubting is complex, especially when woven into the, to the claims that it led women into creating new and holy alliances with the devil in order to gain power. While both Aquinas and the writers of the Malleus Maleficarum represented women as weak and malformed, such a position nonetheless also implicitly recognizes a fear of openness and desire in women to access a worldview outside of the patriarchal order they were expected to function within. While the Malleus Maleficarum imagines the relationship between the witch and the devil in hypersexualized terms, everything is governed by carnal lust uh, in women, Rather than framing the witch-devil relationship in less lurid terms of the straightforward knowledge exchange that takes place in the garden, 
as Stephen, Walter Stevens suggests, this image of the witch nonetheless appears to recognize that sexual relations with the devil permitted women accused of witchcraft to discover the true nature of their paramours. Indeed, this co-location of sex and knowledge is something that is inherited from the biblical text, but the primary language for intercourse is the euphemism to know another person. Eve is the first woman to know the devil within the Christian context. She engages in thoughtful conversation with the phallic serpent and at his suggestion takes the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and bad. When her story also comes rolled in, becomes rolled into the tradition of fallen angels taking women as sexual partners, it starts to become clear how she is in many ways the first witch. So by fraternizing with the devil, women may undergo the most intense possible form of interpersonal contact, a form of knowledge gathering, which allows them first-hand experience, unlike male theologians, of the real existence of demons and also how to use this knowledge to their advantage. In other words, by falling for the devil, women gained access to a whole world of knowledge which challenged, destabilized and threatened the male order. They practiced sexual freedom which broke boundaries, queering the divide between human, spiritual and often animal worlds. While patriarchal writers like those responsible for the Malleus Maleficarum condemned the idea of Eve conducting such behavior because it was so threatening, we can begin to see why Eve and the witch pr proved to be such powerful symbols for a feminist counterculture. And so I'm going to bring this paper to an end with a new beginning, one which I have not yet fully embarked on. I'm left wondering to what extent even woman has been used through the ages to embody heresy and bad faith. Certainly there's evidence that from as early as heresy began to be conceptualized within Christianity, she's there. From Paul representing those who turn away from him as being like as being deceived like Eve's in 2 Corinthians 11, to Justin Martyr, Athanasius and Epiph Epiphanius, modeling the targets of their heresiology as Eve taking the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And I also think about the Jewish traditions that we find in one Enoch and the claims in the Mishnah and the Talmud that women are more attracted to magic. So, to conclude, I would argue the conceptualization of Eve and the witch as images of transgressive knowledge, of doubt, of embodying the critical adversary appears to be alive and well in the feminist movement today, inherited from its early modern, um, much more um, uh, persecutory um, uh, roots. Much more to do, but I suppose I'll conclude by saying this has just been another story showing how one man sinner is another woman's savior. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. That there's just so much um, for us to talk about in that paper. It's really rich and just incredibly um, engaging as well. So thank you so much for, for sharing that um, with us. Um, I can I can see that um, we we have a question in the chat um, already. Um, so, um, Alison, would you like to ask your question or should I read that out for you um, appear on screen? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'll, I'll just make myself appear as if by magic. There I am. Um, hi, that was hi. just an amazing paper. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for it listening. Just, and for it, oh, it was it was so good. It was so good. So interesting and went off in so many different directions. Um, I um, I'm a historian and a student of literature um, and I have kind of worked on 18th century witches but much later 18th century witches so I'm looking at witchcraft um, after the 1736 witchcraft act which kind of demagicifies witchcraft and specifically I've been looking at it in relation to satirical writing of the 18th century oh, um, wow. yeah and um, one of the things that I've been um, looking at is very much this this idea that the witch herself kind of becomes this this um this cultural site where you you get a number of different ideas um coming together and that each of them can then be used as a shorthand for the other and i know this is exactly what you've been saying in that that's happening at the moment in in the modern period um and specifically i've been looking at um wives and witches and the idea that, which i think is diane perkins's idea that the the witch is like the anti-wife or the anti-woman oh, yes. um, and how this works in kind of ideas of divorce 
in 18th century divorce um, and also cosmetics. And this is where my question lies. Um, there used to be uh, that there's a very famous piece of 18th century satire, which a lot of people don't realize is a satire, um, which said that if you your wife was caught wearing cosmetics, you could dis divorce your wife, which is, of course, completely mm. complete nonsense. And I say that as a former divorce lawyer myself this is this has never been true but obviously it links to this idea of the witch somehow having a defective or um an ugly yeah. body and again you see this even today with Roald Dahl's witches who disguise themselves as beautiful women and then you know pull their pull, pull their disguises off could you speak if possible is there any link with the Eve figure <laughs> And this aspect of witchcraft, do they kind of cross at this point? Or is that something specifically witchy? I'm not think, conscious of yeah. a particular physical representation. No, we don't really hear very much about her. The only thing that we kind the only way that we kind of gain any knowledge about, or we might get an assumption that she'd be attractive, is that you know, Adam proclaims like at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So you get the sense that there is yeah. some kind of like desire there we don't ever hear about eve's desire until god punishes her in genesis 3 16 where he says okay now you're going to desire your husband lots of questions about that what was going on there um but um yeah i, I guess one of the things that i'm thinking about that is kind of interesting is eve as a, as a wife in the sense that you know she's definitely a wife that needs to be punished as the wife within very specific Mm. terms you know she's made to suffer in childbearing whatever that means I think that's more of an existential suffering than a physical suffering in the original context but and you know her desire is for her husband which does suggest that there is a kind of anxiety about her desire there are also this is slightly tangential but one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a lot is that I'm really fascinated by the fact that magic and sexuality are put together mm -hmm. so female sexuality are put together so much it's biblical that stuff you know like terms for magic and terms for prostitution or sex work or um probably more derogatory terms appear related to one another in a, ha a number of biblical texts and in various motifs so i don't think that really answers your question directly but i there is something to do with anxiety about appearance that does emerge and of course the anxiety about Eve's appearance um, does emerge kind of through the reception history of her of her character. You know, by the time we get to Milton, she falls in love with herself in a, you know, in a pool. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, it is there. I, I'd love to stay in touch with you. I, 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 I'd like to think about that a bit more because there are some really interesting traditions about Eve as like a nagging wife or a gossiping wife. Um, there's also says some, both in Jewish and Christian tradition, so it'd be great to stay in touch. That's quite a rambling answer. That's not that helpful right now, but hey, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I'd I'd love to to, to continue the conversation. Thank great. you. Yeah, th thank you very much, Alison and Holly, for that response. Um, we're already at seven, but there's one more question in the chat. So if you just maybe answer that one, and then yeah, so, yeah. Um, so Hannah, did you want to uh, say that, or should I read that out? Um, just appear if you want to share. Yeah, I'm happy to kind of expand on it a bit. Um, thanks, Holly. That was that was really interesting. And seeing all of the kind of imagery of um, Eve, like utilised by the feminist movement, made me think of like the complete contrast of that and the, like the sexist appropriation of Eve imagery used in pop culture. And it made me think of Katie Edwards' book *Ad Men and Eve* and like the utilisation of, of Eve and like the temptress in kind of advertising in the 2000s. So could you talk about kind of like that like juxtaposition and contrast a bit? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And I've thought about it quite a lot because um, I use I use Katie's work a lot in my teaching because it's just so fascinating. Um, and, you know, I think that there are two different things going on. One is that a lot of that 1960s and 70s, and actually um, even the kind of contemporary stuff is anti-capitalist as well. So in the sense that they're being anti-capitalist feminists, it, had, it makes no sense for the story of temptation to be a temptation to consume 
um, and to acquire. Um, whereas the story of temptation is something that's about knowledge, which is outside of a patriarchal framework, makes total sense. So I thought I always think of it as like a kind of kaleidoscope where you put it in relationship to a whole range of other kind of um, values or needs or requirement and this whole new reading comes out and so you know for me I think I'm really interested in that kind of anti-capitalist uh, and also anti-fascist anti and um, politics that's kind of really grown up um, uh, uh, now that's an inheritor I would say of the sort of socialist feminism not di not always directly there's obviously tensions but you know is building on and moving out from and and and, and uh, developing forwards some of that stuff you know the hexing of um Nick, uh, nixon the hexing of wall street it's a completely different world than um the stuff in katie edwards work the other thing i'd also say is that although the feminine the female eves that appear in the adverts that katie talks about are um intended for female audiences to encourage women to buy products I'm I would be confident to agree with her statement that they're predominantly made in an industry that is dominated by male producers so I would say that they're not post I'd say they're not feministies in the sense that they're not constructed by women but they are made for women so they fit more into traditional interpretation you know patriarchal interpretation than they might first seem to yeah thank you Yes, thank, thank you so much, Holly. Um, it's a, I know, I know we need to, to go. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you ever so much for such a, a wonderful paper that's given us an enormous amount to think about. Um, I'm thinking about all sorts of things, and especially the, the Sabrina the Teenage Witch as well. I wish we'd had that bit. Um, but it was just oh, really I've got a paper. I'll send it to you. Oh, okay, <laughs> the well, paper well, coming <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, coming. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for, for joining us and to all of the audience as well for, for engaging with us and, and asking really, really relevant questions at the end there as well. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to make a little uh, announcement uh, about what is coming up. Um, so first of all, there's actually a, a history department event on the 17th of May um, next week um, when Ivo Goldstein will talk about the Holocaust in the independent state of Croatia. Um, so that's on the 17th of May. And then we have um, from Parks um, with, in combination with the uh, Centre for Medieval and Renaissance Culture, um, the Reuter Lecture by Urban Resnick, um, where he'll talk about um, controversies triggered by the employment of Christian wet nurses by Jews in the Middle Ages. And that is on the 31st of May. Um, so you can find all the details of that on the Parks um, website. Um, but thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you so much again, Polly. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.